Good evening and welcome to tonight's program. My name is Lee Pfeffer and I am the manager of museum experience at the GLBT Historical Society and I thank everyone for joining us tonight. I want to start by acknowledging that the GLBT Historical Society is based on Ohlone tribal land. I invite any indigenous folks with us today to make themselves visible in the chat and be recognized as we honor the contemporary and ancestral lives of America's indigenous peoples. This event is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel and our website on the past events page. If you're watching live along with us while we're doing the event, we welcome your active participation in the chat and encourage you to post comments, questions, and observations. Uh, we will have a short Q&A after the talk this evening for you to be able to ask questions of our speaker. Uh, and before we get into uh, the actual program, I want to tell you a little bit about the society and the work that we do, in case you're not familiar with us. Founded in 1985, the Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgender, or GLBT Historical Society is recognized internationally as a leader in the field of LGBTQ public history. Our mission is to collect preserve, exhibit, and make accessible to the public materials and knowledge to support and promote understanding of LGBTQ history, culture, and arts in all their diversity. We have two sites of operation. We have the GLBT Historical Society Museum, which is in the heart of the Castro at 18th and Collingwood, uh, uh, and it's been open since 2011. And we have the Dr. John P. DiCecco Archives and Research Center in Mid Market District. You can check out our growing array of exhibitions, events, and archival resources online at glbthistory.org. And we had the museum closed for a little bit there because of the Omicron surge, but since things are coming down, uh, we reopened the museum this week on Tuesday, the 23rd. So if you are local and you want to visit the museum, go on in. We'd be happy to see you. We're happy to have folks back. Finally, I want to thank all of our members and donors who truly make our work possible. If you're not already a card carrying member of the GLBT Historical Society, <coughs> excuse me, I invite you to consider joining today. Members get a variety of cool perks, including uh, access to the museum for free for yourself and a guest, a 20% discount on neat merch in our store, both online and in the museum, and you get access to special members only events and you get tickets for our programming for free as well. You can learn uh, more about how you can become a member and other ways that you can support the society by going to glbthistory.org slash join dash give. And now uh, I want to tell you a little bit about our program. So we have a wonderful speaker tonight. Uh, we have Wendy L. Rouse, who will be talking with us about her new book, uh, Public Faces, Secret Lives, A Queer History of the Women's Suffrage Movement, courtesy of NYU Press. Um, and we're going to be talking about the narrative of women's suffrage and uh, you know, the ways in which the traditional narrative has kind of sanitized and erased the contributions and lives of queer and lesbian suffragists. Um, and so I am really excited to bring on Wendy here. Uh, Wendy is a historian specializing in recovering the stories of women and children in the United States during the progressive era. In addition to Public Faces, Secret Lives, Rouse is also the author of Her Own Hero, The Origins of the Women's Self-Defense Movement, which examines the emergence of women's self-defense alongside the first wave of feminism during the Progressive Era, and Children of Chinatown, Growing Up Chinese American in San Francisco, which explores the lives of Chinese American children during the era of Chinese exclusion. She's also an Associate Professor of History at San Jose State. So, hi, Wendy. Hey. Hello. Thank you so much for hopping on and and uh, talking with us tonight and letting everybody know about this uh, piece of history that I think a lot of people just kind of gloss over. Um, and there's so much content rife for exploration there. Yeah, for sure. And thanks for having me. And thanks to the GLBT Historical Society for sponsoring this. 
Thank you. So I'm going to turn it over to you now. You've got some uh, wonderful things you'd like to share from the book. And then uh, when you when Wendy is finished, uh, I'll come back on and we'll have a little bit of a conversation and open it up to questions from the audience. Perfect. Thank you so much. I just want to thank everyone too for tuning in and for listening to this. Maybe you're listening to it live or you're going to tune in later, but I really thank you for being here because I'm super excited to share my research with you and give you some idea of what you could expect um, with the book itself. The book is about the queer history of the suffrage movement and it is due out this May and you can order it on Amazon or on the publisher website at nyupress.org. And I thought I might start a little bit by explaining the book cover, because a lot of people ask me about the book cover. And I want you to know that this is Dr. Mary Edwards Walker. And in 1880, Dr. Walker was arrested. And when she asked the police why they were arresting her, she said they told her it was because she was wearing men's clothing. And she replied, I don't wear men's clothing. I wear my own clothing. So Dr. Walker is really, really fascinating. Um, Dr. Walker's gender queer appearance was definitely really radical for the time that she was living in. And it wasn't the first time she had been arrested. Actually, she had been arrested multiple times throughout her life for defying gender norms through her clothing. And she was a lifelong women's rights activist. She was a dress reformer. And I was really interested in her story and in stories like this one. And I thought it was interesting because I knew there was there must have been like a queer history to the suffrage movement that we just hadn't heard about. So I started to kind of explore this and do a little bit of research. But every time I talked about like developing this into something larger, into a full blown research project, people seemed to suggest that really there wasn't anything there that maybe I wouldn't find anything that they didn't think it was really worth the time to pursue. Um, but I did find stuff and I found so much. And honestly, it was it was just a totally fulfilling project uh, from start to finish. But I get now, after having done the research, why they were expressing the concerns that they were, because they were right to be skeptical. The truth is, is that so much of queer history, and especially the queer history of the suffrage movement, has actually been erased. And this is what Lee was talking about in the intro, right? That obviously a lot comes into play here. We have sexism, we have homophobia, we have transphobia, and that plays a role in this erasure. But also what's interesting to know is that suffragists themselves contributed to this erasure and their descendants and their biographers as well. So just to kind of dive in here a little bit more in depth, I, you need to understand that the suffrage movement in the early 20th century um, was really a radical movement. I mean, we don't really think about that today, right? We think obviously women should have the right to vote. But at this time period, the idea of women voting was extremely radical. And so suffragists were really kind of pushing the boundaries of what was normal for women at the time. And they were so concerned about trying to get people to side with them to try to get some popular support really for the suffrage amendment. Um, that they decided to try to present themselves in a way that was going to appeal to the, the mainstream, the most numbers of people. And that meant presenting themselves in the most respectable light possible. So this often meant highlighting their role as respectable, middle-class, white wives and mothers. And so if you take a look at this image, I mean, that's what you see here, right? They're, they're marching in a suffrage parade. They're dressed all in white. They're waving the flag, showing that they're patriotic American citizens, but they're also parading with their children, with their babies, to show that they are these heterosexual, these wives and mothers, right? And they are um, worthy citizens deserving of the vote. So the downside of the strategy is to marginalize anyone who deviated from that norm and to try to kind of hide anyone who didn't fit this respectable image. So that brings us back to Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, who was viewed as a radical by most mainstream suffragists, who had long since kind of given up this idea of dress reform because they thought that it really got too much negative publicity from the press. So we have suffrage leaders like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who deliberately actually downplays Walker's role in the movement, 
and actually tries to write her literally out of the history of the suffrage movement that they were writing at the time. Um, and she also really wanted to distance herself and her organization uh, from Walker. So Walker gets pushed to the outside of the movement and marginalized in her own uh, fight for the, for the vote and for women's rights. So this is how we can see that, that suffrage leaders start to try to, to conceal the queerness of the movement and kind of minimize the role of people like Walker. So we can see this process then of erasure starting in the suffrage movement itself. And some suffragists even went so far as to actually hide evidence of their own personal lives, especially those that were involved in love affairs. They literally sometimes burned their letters, if not during the time, then later on in their life when they were concerned about their reputation, they were concerned about the stories that people would tell about them after they passed. So sometimes the suffragists themselves did this, and sometimes it was actually their descendants or biographers who would try to rewrite their story. So, so much of this story has been lost. So therefore it really does become important for someone like me or historians in general to sift through the ashes, to try to recover the fragments that remain and to reconstruct some of these really long lost stories. So today and in the book, I use the word queer a lot. And sometimes when I'm talking to audiences, they're not sure exactly you know, what I mean by this term or why I use this term. So I just want to clarify from the outset that when I use the term queer, I'm using it as an umbrella term to describe the ways that suffragists challenge the gender and sexual norms of their time period. So some of these individuals, if they lived in our current time, they might actually identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community. But it's important to remember that during the time that I'm talking about, during this period under study, there really was no term, there, there was no lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, non-binary, asexual, aromantic, genderqueer, all those words that we use today were not used back then. But that doesn't mean that queer folks haven't existed and have always existed, even if the terms that we use now weren't used during that time period. So I'm gonna use the term queer broadly, for individuals who, if they were alive today, might identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community. But I also talk about queering the suffrage movement. And what I mean by that is I look in the book, I look at the ways, not only that these suffragists were defying gender and sexual norms, but the ways that they were queering uh, concepts of family, domesticity, and even ideas about death. So the ways that they're literally like turning things upside down within the movement. And when I was thinking about like the stories, right, there's so many interesting stories I could honestly tell you. Um, there's so many queer suffragists that I get excited and want to tell them all. But just a few examples of what you'll read about in the book. Um, you'll read about Annie Tinker, who was actually born the generation after Dr. Mary Edwards Walker. But she also refused to conform to gendered notions about how a woman should act and how a woman should dress. And she's famous for stealing the show in a New York City suffrage parade when she emerged in a masculine outfit and a top hat, leading a cavalry of suffragists on horseback down the streets in New York City. And the press at the time, they really kind of criticized her, quote, mannish appearance. And other suffragists painted her as an eccentric socialite who was just trying to get attention. Uh, but Tinker used her time and the attention that she received to really advocate for a woman's right to dress as she pleased and to pursue the career of her choice. And so she really was um, a radical queer suffragist for her time period. And then there are queer suffragists like Dr. Margaret Chung. And Dr. Chung not only challenged the gender conventions through her clothing and her behavior, but she also called out the xenophobia and the racism, both inside and outside the suffrage movement. And Chung, as you can see here, um, she wore her hair slicked back in her early part of her career. Um, she wore a tailored suit, a hat, and a cane. And she was known as Mike by her friends. And again, she received a lot of attention. I mean, she's a pioneering Chinese-American woman doctor in the early 20th century. So she, whenever she was interviewed by the press, she would try to draw attention to the bigger issues, especially the issues that immigrant women or Chinese-American women living in the United States face. So she talked about segregation and she talked about exclusionary immigration laws. 
So again, she was really radical for her era as well. And then there's Alice Dunbar Nelson. And Alice uh, not only fought for the vote, but for the equality of the Black community. So through her speeches, uh, she talked about you know, the need for women to have the vote, but specifically she talked about the need for Black women to have the vote, to be able to fight against discrimination and racialized violence. And she tried as much as possible to really cultivate this public image as this um, married woman or her husband, she had divorced her husband and he had passed away. So later on, she talked about being a widowed woman and she wanted to present herself in the most respectable light possible because it was so hard uh, to gain support for the cause, but also especially for black women to gain support from the mainstream. So she presented herself as this professional heterosexual woman, but privately she lived her own queer life and she had relationships with men. She had relationships with women. And we get glimpses of these when you look at her diaries and her letters. And it, through extracting this information, you really get a sense of um, this kind of queer life that existed among Black suffragists of the era and even later on in the 20s and 30s, which continues with her diaries and letters then. So these are just a few of the stories that you're going to find in the book. Um, and I, the book dives into it a lot more. And as you read through the book, um, remember that we only get little glimpses here and there. We don't have the whole story, which is sometimes you know frustrating because it's like, oh, I want to know more. But we only have glimpses because it's with the fragments that we're able to recover that kind of help us understand this history a little bit more. So today, what I thought I would do is try to focus on a couple of stories that uh, are really interesting, a little bit more in depth to give you a sense. Um, because the book's organized thematically, you'll you'll get glimpses of people here and there. So I kind of wanted to, to give you an overarching story here to go with. So years ago, when I first started this uh, research, I was away for a few weeks in an archives and I was just doing like an exploratory trip where you try to figure out what's there. Is this worth pursuing? You know, people said there's nothing out there. So maybe I need to check first. And I had been going through um, some suffragist records for a while and I was going through these records and I had been there so long and I, I really wasn't finding anything. And it was getting to the point where I was getting very kind of frustrated. And I thought, you know what, this might not be worth the time and the, the expenses of, of traveling here. So I thought, you know, maybe I do need to give up. Maybe there's just no uh, queer history of the suffrage movement. Maybe what everybody said was true. I just need to walk away. And that's uh, when I found Alice Morgan Wright. And Alice was a suffragist. And that's why I was going through her papers. I didn't know that much about her life, but um, I was really interested in trying to learn more from the little bit I knew. And as I was skimming through her papers, I actually came across a poem that was in the back of one of her like sketchbooks from college where she, she drew uh, lots of different sketches of people. And she also had kind of written these drafts of poems, most of which were very hard to read and crossed out and whatnot. And I came across this poem and as I'm skimming these poems, cause it's mostly, you know, teenage angst cause it's the college era and there, and she's uh, talking about everything that's happening in her life. I come across one that's about heartbreak and pain and lost love. And it turns out that Alice is writing about another woman. She's talking about her love that she has lost. And she imagines herself in this poem as she's the king and her, her girlfriend is the queen. And the two of them live and they love freely together in a beautiful, magical kingdom. She talks about that there's fields of poppies and there's rainbow mountains. And it's this magical world that's of their own making. And in this world where they live alone, their love for each other is enough. They only need each other. They walk side by side. They walk hand in hand, she says. And there's perfect happiness. There's perfect harmony as long as they remain secluded and hidden from public view. And in this little world, everything is, is perfect. But Alice notes that eventually the sun rises. And as the sun rises, the dawn breaks, and she watches as the love dies from her lover's eyes. And then kind of reality starts to dawn. And she says, the world of things that are appears and the world of things that seem fades away. So as it comes to an end, Alice reflects on the dream of their potential life that they could have had together. And she thinks back on that 
and tries to fondly hold on to that memory. So this poem represents not only an expression of queer love, but it's also like a coming to terms with a world that denies them the ability to live in love openly and freely in the light of day. So this poem really was profoundly moving when I read it at the time. And Alice's poems, as I continued to go through them, many of them were very moving like this and many of them had to do with queer love. But again, they were scribbled on scraps of paper, hidden in the back of the notebooks, never published. I don't think she intended for them to be read by others, um, but they're little glimpses into her queer life. And so this gave me hope that there's there's more here, potentially. There's more for me to, to see and to find. Um, so I began to try to piece together the fragments. And, and through that, I was able to kind of reconstruct the story of Alice's life. So I'll tell you what I know about Alice. So Alice Morgan Wright was a hopeless romantic. I figured that out from her poems, but also there's pictures like this one. She's got her knee up on the on the log and she, she's sitting next to a woman who has flowers. So I'm assuming this was one of her many crushes that she had throughout college, lots of romantic crushes. And I found evidence of these in her poems and in her letters that her classmates actually wrote about her. Um, people actually talked about Alice and him, here's Alice and she's falling in love and whatnot. So this is a picture of one of uh, Alice's crushes. Um, and I don't know who this was, um, but it may have been the woman she wrote the poem about. I'm not positive. But Alice had a friend in college at the time named Edith Good. And Edith actually went to college with Alice. And she wrote in her letters to friends, she wrote about Alice and she talked about a friend who was hopelessly in love with Alice and, you know, she was worried about this friend and that, you know, she just needed, they needed to, to let this relationship go. And um, the friend was engaged to be married to a young man. And anyway, so it was a very dramatic uh, exchange for that, for them. Now, Edith thought that Alice had, she said, Edith said that Alice has no sway over me, right? She was not at all impacted by Alice's charm. In fact, she told her friend, she said, being with Alice is like reading a French novel. It's a lot of philosophy, a lot of emotion and a strange character only partly revealed. So Edith wasn't really that impressed with Alice in college, but after college, Alice um, and Edith kind of, they went their own separate ways. They lived their own lives. Alice moved to Europe to pursue a career as a sculptor. And she actually has quite a long career in sculpting and becomes pretty well known for some of her, her works. And she was also a believer in the cause of suffrage and she had been since college. Uh, but she became even more fervent about it when she was crossing the Atlantic to go to Europe to study art. And she met and developed a crush on yet another woman. And this time it was Emmeline Pankhurst, the leader of the militant suffrage movement in Britain. Now, Alice and Emmeline became friends and Alice was enamored. I would say she was even like hero worshiping. Um, Emmeline, because Emmeline was famous. People, everybody knew who Emmeline Pankhurst was. So when she met her, it was like, here I am with this charismatic um, leader of the suffrage movement. So Alice was writing letters back to a friend back home and she's talking about like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe I'm talking to her. So it's a combo of feelings. You can, you can see the hero worship and you can also kind of sense this romantic inf infatuation as well in the way that she talks about her. Um, so Emmeline disembarks in London and Alice travels on to Paris and they continue to write to each other. Alice writes to tell her everything that's going on in her life and Pankhurst writes back and talks a lot about, you know, what's happening in the British uh, movement and some of the activism and some of the, the rests that start to take place. I don't think Emmeline ever had any feelings for Alice. I'm sure she did not. She had so many uh young suffragists especially that were enamored with her um but she was definitely uh, she definitely kept in touch with alice uh, throughout the next uh, few months now at this point in time what's happening in the british militant suffrage movement is that the suffragists in britain were honestly getting quite fed up they had spent years petitioning the government begging the men in power to give women the vote and they saw zero change. So under uh, Emmeline's leadership, 
the suffragists began to shift tactics. They started to use marches. They started to use demonstrations. They did uh, these things to try to get the attention of the government and get the attention of the media. But what ended up happening is more and more confrontations with the police. And it got to the point that suffragists were actually physically and sexually assaulted by the police on the streets of London. And in one infamous suffrage demonstration, which later became known as Black Friday, it ended in violence when the police brutally beat hundreds of suffragists in the streets. This was so traumatic and, and so many people were injured. Emmeline's own sister suffered injuries that day and weeks later passed away. And so finally they, they started to get really frustrated. They're like, enough is enough. And Emmeline Pankhurst declared deeds, not words, which was the motto of their organization. And she ended up giving a, a very fiery speech to a crowd of women in London. And she said, why should we go to Parliament Square and be battered about and insulted? We've submitted years to this, to insult, to assault, and now women have lost their lives. So she declared that they wouldn't do this any longer. They wouldn't allow the government to break their bodies. Instead, she said, let's break glass. So she literally called for a mass window breaking campaign uh, throughout London. Now, Alice was back in Paris and she's reading about this in the newspapers and she's reading about it in the letters. And she's like, I cannot, I cannot sit here and, and wait anymore. I have to be a part of this. So she actually travels over to London and she takes part in this mass window breaking campaign. So in March, 1912, she's arrested. She's holding a stone in her hand when she's arrested. It's wrapped in a paper that says taxation without representation is tyranny. And that's uh, an ode to her American uh, citizenship, but also siding with this, the women fighting for suffrage in, in England. So she's arrested. The judge sentences her to two months in jail, along with hundreds of other suffragists who were arrested that night. So then Alice's parents, they're back home in New York, and they hear about this by reading the newspaper. They see these headlines that say, American girl arrested in London, and they are shocked, uh, probably very angry, um, and very worried for sure, because her father starts to consult lawyers to see what their options are. And then her mother actually rushes over to England as fast as you could in those days to try to get her daughter out of jail. But in jail, Alice was actually quite content. She was jailed with Emmeline and the other suffragists and they continued their protests. The suffragists, you've probably heard about this, right? They launched hunger strikes to demand that their status as political prisoners be recognized. Um, and Alice joins them. She refuses to take in any food. The government then is concerned that the suffragists might die while they're under their care. So the government calls for the forced feeding of suffragists. Nurses held the women down. Doctors shoved plastic tubes down their throat or down their nostrils and poured raw eggs and milk directly into their stomach. The suffragists vomited, they bled, they endured great pain from these violent procedures. And some became deathly ill uh, and some were on the verge of dying when they were eventually forced to be released uh, from prison because of this. And others continued uh, the strike or tried to keep up their spirits any way they could. Um, they sung songs together. They passed notes secretly to each other uh, through, the, through the pipes and whatnot. And behind the bars of Holloway, Alice was actually quite content, like I said, because she was imprisoned with the other suffragists and she's imprisoned with Emmeline. Now, Emmeline wasn't actually allowed to interact with the other suffragists. She was um, put in like solitary confinement, right, to protect them. The, the government was afraid that um, Emmeline would, would rile up the suffragists and cause more protests. So um, Alice didn't get to see her, but Alice was very, very concerned about her, thought about her all the time. And so she bided her time while she was in prison writing love poems to Emmeline. And I did find these poems on the scrap of paper. There was several writings on the scrap of papers. This was the most exciting thing, actually, I found. 
Um, this was the prison paper and these were love poems to Emmeline Pankhurst. And there's lots of them, but one of them says, four walls go round my prison cell and somewhere beyond there is your cell. Can prison walls put out the stars or take away my love for you? And then she says, what if today and yesterday have given me no sight of you? It is enough the whole night through to think that perhaps tomorrow may. I think although you do not know, your heart must be a little gay because of me since day by day and hour by hour, I love you so. So there's just, uh, there's several of these poems to Emmeline and it, they're just expressing her love and adoration. And then Alice was a sculptor as well. So she had smuggled in some little bits of clay. And while she was um, there, she also created a, a, a bust to, of Emmeline in honor of her. And it's actually really small. It's, it's a very, very tiny when you see it in real life. So that's how she was able to kind of keep it quiet. So again, no romance ever developed between Alice and Emmeline, but this is just an example of like the, how queer relationships, whether they were friendships, crushes, or sexual affairs, how they helped bind suffragists together. And they actually kind of forged these alliances that are not only within the suffrage movement in the United States or in the United Kingdom, but like actually connecting Britain and uh, the US. So these like cross, uh, cross Atlantic alliances. And queer suffragists like Alice Morgan Wright were among the first to go to the front lines, the first to submit their bodies to police assault, the first to endure arrest, imprisonment, hunger strikes, and forced feedings, all for the cause. So while Alice is in Europe, her old college chum, Edith Good, is back in the United States, and they are fighting for suffrage as well. Now, Edith was actually a part of the Congressional Union, which was a U.S. organization that was trying to push for the passage of a federal suffrage amendment that would grant um, women the right to vote. And so she was traveling across the country and she was speaking on behalf of the suffrage amendment. And she was part of this organization that later becomes the National Women's Party. And they begin picketing the White House. And so these, you've probably heard of this organization or you know, you've seen these photos of these suffragists standing literally at Wilson, President Wilson's gate, demanding that he support the passage of a suffrage amendment. So the silent sentinels, as they became known, were borrowing from the tactics of the British suffragists and they were trying to do a, a demonstration, a very visible protest against the government. And just like their British counterparts, they were arrested um, they were imprisoned. They eventually would go on hunger strike and they would also be force fed. So they really were borrowing from the techniques of each other. And part of this was because so many American women had gone over to Britain and had studied the tactics and brought them back. And here again, in this movement too, we see queer suffragists are among the first to volunteer to go to the front lines. Some of the first to submit their bodies to police assault. Some of the First to endure arrest, imprisonment, hunger strikes, and force feeding for the cause. So Alice eventually comes back to the United States where she's reunited with Edith and they become friends again. And it was really their mutual belief in the cause of women's rights and in suffrage that brought them together. So they both continue working in the campaign for the vote. Alice works in the New York state campaign and Edith continues to work in the federal uh, movement. And they both push for the ratification of the 19th amendment. And when the, when the amendment is ratified, they both continue with the national women's party and they end up fighting for the equal rights amendment, which is still uh, an, a, an issue even to this day, but they were among the first group to be pushing for that. And it was their experiences in these movements that bound them together and made them friends again. And in fact, Edith, it seems, no longer objected to Alice's philosophical, emotional, and strange character. In fact, I think she began to like it. So in the years after their career as suffragists, they became partners. Neither one of them ever married. Um, instead, they chose to be with each other. And like so many of the queer suffragists that you'll read about in the book, they form their own like chosen family. They form their own community, their own networks. They actually spent uh, much of their time together, either living in their in their own separate family homes, or they had uh, um, 
Edith's family farm was in Woodstock, Vermont, and they spent some time there. And Wright actually opened an art studio there to be nearer to Edith. And friends visited them in up there in uh, Vermont. And they often when they would write to them, they would write to them together as a couple and they would ask about them. So Alice and Edith continued their activism. And that's what's most interesting about this book, right? Is I talk about the suffragists, the queer suffragists within the context of the suffrage movement. But remember that their life goes on beyond that and they continue as activists and they continue to, to live their queer lives um, well into, into the later part of the 20th century. So um, they continue their fight. They actually, in 1945, they become part of a delegation of women that um, fights with the United Nations to adopt a declaration of full equality for women and a commission on the status of women. So that's what this picture is here. And then later in their lives, they become really, really involved in the cause of animal rights. And they actually form the National Humane Education Society, and they begin working for the humane treatment of animals. And that is the cause that really motivates them in the latter part of their lives. So as I was researching them, and I'm trying to uncover like what exactly their relationship was, it's obviously very difficult because I never was able to find the letters that they wrote to each other. And really this shouldn't surprise us, right? Because we know about queer erasure now and we know that, you know, probably things may have been destroyed. So I had to do a lot of reading between the lines to try to figure out what their relationship was. And one of the things that helped was Alice's propensity for writing poems because I really started to look at these little scraps of paper in the back of her book and to try to, to try to read them and figure out what they were. And so I found lots of unfinished drafts of Valentine's Day poems that Alice was writing and was dedicating to Edith. And I could tell that they were to Edith because it said EJG, the, that's Edith's initials. And she would write these every year on Valentine's Day. And this, these each attest to her really deep and in during love for um, Edith. And as they grew older, Wright grew even more contemplative in her poetry. And so she started to kind of reflect on their life together. One of the poems was really moving. It says, my hands are torn by the spokes I clutch as the wheeling years go by and the dust of their passing graze my head and my eyes are dim with the dust they shed. And think how year by year, I love my lovely dear. She is my noonday bright. She is my starry night. She is my heart's delight, my very dear. So these very emotional and loving letters, poems that she wrote for, for Edith um, are kind of scattered throughout her papers. And again, you can tell that they're not the final draft. Um, and I don't have the final draft, so I'm not sure what happened to those. I never saw them, but they're just, just uh, kind of fragments of her writing. Now, Alice and Edith lived quite a long time, but as they grew older, they um, cared for each other in their old age. And at one point they even end up in the hospital together at the same time. And so Alice wrote to a friend and she said that they still tried to stay connected. She said, every morning at 1030, I hobble across the street and I wave at her uh, at her window. And at first her nurse comes and then she comes out and waves back at me. So again, this was just fascinating to kind of like follow their whole life from the time that they were suffragists later on um, as they're aging and their couple together. But I, I continue to wonder like, where is their correspondence? You know, what happened to it? Did they burn it? I didn't know. Um, because there was so, like every scrap of paper was in Alice's collection. Like there was, there was so much detail in there um, and there were letters to other people, but there was just no letters between them. So I knew that there was something important about why they weren't there. And one day I actually found a hint. I was reading their later letters later, later on in their life. And in 1967, Alice actually got really, really sick and they thought she was going to pass away. And so Edith and another friend of theirs began to like compile all of Alice's personal stuff and to try to get it, you know, kind of organized and, and ready. Um, and that's when, uh, Edith wrote to the friend and she wrote, I want to read every scrap of Alice's memoranda that we've assembled. And I want to read her correspondence with me over the years. So that's what happened to it. Um, Edith took it out of Alice's uh, personal collection and must have gotten rid of it in her own way. Or uh, I'm not sure if she kept it until later on in life, but 
uh, that's why it was not there. Edith asked to see it. So I'm assuming she wanted to scrub it. She might have wanted to get rid of it. She might have wanted to read anything that maybe reflected unfavorably upon her or upon Alice. And she definitely wanted to kind of shape that story about them in the future. But this was evidence that there were letters between them. They did once exist and they, they were removed. So Edith actually passed away before Alice did in 1970. And she was laid to rest in the good, uh, Edith Good family plot in Springfield, Ohio. And Alice was absolutely devastated by this decision. And the way that the reason we know this is in some of her drafts of her will, she asked that they be buried next to each other in her family plot in the Albany, New York cemetery. Um, but this didn't happen. And what I know is that this impacted Alice deeply because in the back, in the very back of one of her address books and very difficult to read like pencil, she wrote about this, this, grief that she had over this decision that was made by someone obviously other than her. And she, she wrote, my wanting leaves something to be desired. My writing leaves something to be desired, but I should never forget these names, Edith Good and Alice Wright. I believe there's never been a moment in all these years when I have not put these two names together. Why on earth didn't I put these names together the last time? So she was very upset over this decision not to, uh, not to be buried together that that somehow um, someone else must have made uh, on their behalf. So five years later, Alice ends up passing away and she's buried separately from Edith. So although they were never interred together and this was her, a wish that she had that was never fulfilled, she did create an endowed trust in both of their names. And it kind of stood as like a memorial of their life together, right? And it's called the Alice Morgan Wright and the Edith Good Fund. And it was created in their memory to support the National Humane Education Society. And it continued on, um, I believe, until the present day, but it's, it's been around for a long time. So this kind of led me on a different path, knowing this idea that they had created this memorial together. Um, and I started to think about the ways that queer suffragists cared for each other, not only in life, but also in death. So I started to look at things like probate records, death records, cemetery records. And what I found is that queer suffragists actually adopted, adapted, and queered heteronormative death rituals. There were monuments, there were memorials uh, that allowed suffragists to preserve the memory and to remain connected to each other even after their death. And this led me to stories like Gail Laughlin and Dr. Mary Austin Sperry um, who were another one of my favorite stories in the book. Um, Laughlin and Sperry were actually local California suffragists, and they worked in the San Francisco Bay Area. And they met fighting for the right to vote here in California in the state suffrage campaign. They worked together on that campaign, and they eventually moved in together. They lived in California for a while. They lived in Colorado, and then they moved back to San Francisco. And they were together for 14 years until Sperry passed away unexpectedly in the 1919 influenza epidemic. And in her will, Sperry left her property to Laughlin and requested that her bodily remains be given to Laughlin as well. And this is where it got really interesting because the Sperry family came in and they contested the will. They were mad that the property was being passed on to this person who wasn't a family member. And they accused Laughlin of, of manipulating the situation. They said Laughlin was, quote, mannish which was code essentially at the time or the way that they would describe someone who was maybe a lesbian or gender nonconforming. They would often use the term mannish. And Dr. Sperry's mother actually told the judge that Laughlin and Sperry slept together in the same bed as if to imply that, you know, there was something different about their relationship. So the case was eventually settled. The court sided with Sperry and um, Sperry's will was honored and especially the part that Laughlin would be responsible for caring for uh, Sperry's physical remains and the Sperry family was absolutely furious. So in the family plot in Stockton in, in California, they had a uh, on the on the, the the tombstone that's for the whole family. They had Mary Sperry's name included on there and they wrote in memoriam, suggesting that their daughter's rightful place actually remained with the family 
in the family plot. But Gail Laughlin kept her partner's ashes with her for the rest of her life. And until the very day that she died, which is some 30 plus years later, in 1952, um, she kept her partner's ashes with her. And at that time, she requested that their remains be interred in the same grave in her family plot in Maine with both of their names etched together on a single marker. And I actually went to the cemetery in Maine. I actually found the, the headstone and I did find that indeed it does have both of their names on etched together on the marker. And this is really moving because it's really a commemoration of their life together, not only in this world, but in the world beyond. And it really stands as that kind of testament of their deep and enduring love for each other. So I think this whole process really reminded me that one of the purposes of learning history is to find ourselves in the past. And we know how important this is. We know this is important for our children who are studying history in school. We know it's important for all marginalized groups and especially for the queer community because we rarely get to see ourselves in the past. And so these stories, these stories of oppression, of survival, of persistence, and even of resistance are so crucial because these stories help us understand ourselves. And so that's why I wanted to work on recovering these histories. And I hope that you learn this history and I hope that you help pass it on. So thank you very much for listening and I hope you get the book and enjoy it. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really, really cool to see some familiar faces to myself in that. Um, I know that we have a little tiny, tiny little bit on um, Mary Sperry and Gail Laughlin in the museum. Um, it's uh, it's one of my favorite little bits. And so it's cool to see that, you know, really uh, come around. And I, I am really excited to receive my copy of this book and really dive uh, even more into it. Um, uh, I put this in the comments, but if anyone has any questions for Wendy, uh, anything that you would love to ask, just put it in the comments. Um, we have a few minutes, so we'll have a little bit of a, a chat. Um, but I have a couple of questions for you. Um, I wanted to ask, I mean, you, you talked a little bit of, at the beginning about, you know, a lot of people kind of discouraged you from doing this work because you might have difficulty in your research, uh, what were, you know, some of your biggest challenges in tackling the research, uh, whether it was finding sources or interpreting it, or even just, you know, a dearth of things that you had to kind of sift through? Yeah, all of the above, I would say. Um, yeah, because erasure was such a big problem, that was that was the biggest issue. Like, even in the story of Laughlin and Sperry, right? Um, there's this memorial, there's this this headstone that has both their names on it. So you would think that the story of their life together is told somewhere, but I couldn't find it anywhere. And e there was a, even a biography written in 1979 by the descendants of Gail Laughlin and it told her whole story, but it just mentions Sperry in like a, a tiny paragraph in the whole book. And it just mentions it. Oh, she was a close friend. So just so much of this, like glossing over people's really intimate relationships and just Re referencing them as a friend or a companion or something. So that was part of it and trying to, to kind of figure out, well, what was their relationship? Um, and it just takes so much work. It takes a lot of looking in the in-between places. Like I talked about going to the back and looking at scribbled notes in the back of notebooks or address books. Um, it's also a lot about looking at archival silences, which is this concept that historians and archivists talk about which is like not just looking at like, okay, I'm gonna go through someone's papers and see what's there, but also looking at what's not there and thinking about, wow, there's a whole gap here. Why is there this gap? Trying to figure out like where this information went. Um, did it ever exist? Does it still exist? Was it destroyed and, and why? So I had to do a lot of that. Um, and there's interesting stories in there too about people destroying people's letters and trying to protect others' reputation. Um, and then I would say the other big challenge was just in trying to convince folks that this project was even worthy of pursuing, like I mentioned, um, not only because it involved um, queer history, but also because it involved women's history. Um, there's just not always a lot of support for that. But the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment happened in 2020. 
And I suddenly found this like upsurge of interest for a very short period of time where everyone was like, oh yeah, this is so interesting. So that helped really mobilize me and, and move me forward in the research as people wanted to help support the effort. Yeah, I think it's really interesting uh, that you say about the, um, you know, about the archival silence is it's, um, I think a lot of people make assumptions that, you know, if you don't necessarily find something specific, that that means it doesn't exist, uh, which is not always the case. It means, you know, it's, you really do have to look at the gaps and deliberate um, blank spaces and also, you know, what that means contextually too. Um, so I, I really like that you said that. Uh, we've got a couple of folks uh, asking questions. Uh, Kit Waffle asks, did you find direct evidence of suffragists or families writing to people about the need to not be mannish or the impropriety of living together in your in your research? Any like kind of um, correspondence? Yes, so th hi Kit, thanks for tuning in. Um, yeah, for sure. Like there is a lot of concern about the gender presentation of suffragists and a lot of it is unspoken and some of it is directly spoken, but there's things like they would send them lists of what they should wear for parades and, you know, we recommend you wear this out. So kind of like dress codes for proper appearance. So when, when somebody like uh, Annie Tinker is dressed the way that she is, I mean, she's literally like stepping outside of what would have been, what she should have been dressing as. Um, and so, yeah, there's definitely concern about that. Um, I talk a little bit in the book about a suffragist here in San Jose, where I'm at, um, named Eugene DeForest, who if he were alive today, he would probably identify as a trans man. Um, and he's very fast. That's a great story. He lived in late 19th century California. And he actually created a family, a chosen family of suffragists, which is why his story intersects with this book. Um, and his story is super relatable, not only because he's from my hometown, but he's talking about like his fight to live his true self. And he does have a, some conflicts over his decision um, to very publicly announce his uh, gender history. Um, and, and so there is some discussion about that and his gender presentation at the time. Neat. Uh, Daniel Bao asks, what's your next research project? And did you come up with further research ideas or inspiration while you were in the process of working on this book? I imagine it took you in a whole bunch of different directions. Yeah, I think this is the book. So this is my third book. And every time I find something that's interesting, I put it aside and think, okay, I'll develop that in the future. But I often like keep going back to it. Like I can't focus. I feel like sometimes when I'm researching. So yes, I found lots of things that I'm interested in pursuing further. Right now I'm actually looking at um, the ways that suffragists relationships in general were impacted. So not just their close romantic relationships or their queer relationships, but literally like their relationships with their mothers and their, and their fathers and their friends and their sisters, because I found a lot of conflict going on in their personal lives over their decision to be involved in the suffrage movement. So that's fascinating to me. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do with that, but I've been looking at that a lot recently. And obviously the queer history um, just continues to fascinate me. And I'm sure you know, more will come out. Um, people send me stuff now that I'm doing talks about it. And just, there's just so many different directions you can take this in from the individuals. So I think there's so much more work to be done out there in general in queer history, but especially during this time period, because a lot of people are hesitant to look into it. Hmm. Uh, we have another one from Sarah Claytor. Uh, did you meet any other authors doing similar research into this project? And if so, who? Um, you know, would, folks would love to know uh, how can this, they can support your work as well as uh, other similar scholars uh, working in, in this same kind of topic. Um, I didn't really meet anyone who was looking at the queer history of the suffrage movement as a whole, but there are lots of folks that are working on individual biographies of suffragists. Um, so like Anya Jabor has a book on Sophie Breckenridge and her relationship her queer relationship. Uh, there's there's books on um, Anna Howard Shaw and her queer relationships. So there are there's a new book on Alice Dunbar Nelson that just came out. Actually, you should check that out. And, and um, so there's and there's a book on Dr. Margaret Chung too, if you're interested. So there are people who are diving deeper into individuals, 
not necessarily in the context of the suffrage movement, though. They're looking at their whole lives. So I think that that's a fascinating direction. If you're interested in reading more about individuals that appear in the book, make sure you check the, the bibliography and the endnotes and, and see if you can uh, kind of dive deeper into whatever interests you. Um, but there's so much more work to be done here that I'm sure um, there will be people doing projects in the future on, on similar topics. Wonderful. Yeah, and we actually had a comment uh, near the beginning of the program from uh, from Daniel again, uh, mentioning that uh, Dr. Margaret Chung was um, Elsa Gidlow's doctor and friend, who uh, we have a large collection of uh, Elsa Gidlow material in the archives, and we have um, uh, actually, I believe we have a whole primary source set. So if you want to see, you know, more folks from this this time period and some mentions of uh, Margaret Chung, you can look at that. Uh, I know that we are kind of running running low on time here. We're, we were going to end up, uh, clo close up a little bit uh, around seven, but I wanted to kind of close things out by asking you, um, you know, how did writing the book kind of shift your understanding of suffragists and the movement? Uh, where were you, you know, before you kind of got this idea, this inkling to start looking into this? Yeah, I... I've taught history for over 20 years and, you know, every time you get to the unit on the suffrage movement, I've kind of always seen it as really just primarily a fight for the vote. And I haven't really thought much beyond that, especially when I'm teaching it. Um, and I think this book made me realize that it's bigger. It's obviously encompassing a wide number of women's rights that they're fighting for, but also like the number of individuals involved in the movement and why they joined and what their goals were is so much broader than I imagined. So if you think about it for queer suffragists, this fight isn't just about the vote. It means that they can live the way that they want to live, dress the way they want to dress and love who they want to love. And so that is really my biggest takeaway from, from writing the book. Wonderful. Uh, well, thank you so much Wendy, again, for uh, spending this evening with us and kind of sharing all of these stories about these uh, wonderful women and other people who are involved in this movement. Um, if you are interested in getting the book, uh, like uh, Wendy mentioned at the beginning here, uh, you can go to nyupress.org and put in the code ROUSE30 to get 30% uh, off. And we also, if you want to kick a uh, kick kick a couple of dollars to the Historical Society. We have it up on our bookshop.org page. You can get it there. Um, and you can check out more of Wendy's work on her website, as well as Twitter. Uh, you said that the best best place to kind of follow what you're doing is, is on your Twitter, you said, right? Yeah. That's Wonderful. All right. Well, uh, Thank you again. I hope that you have a lovely evening and I thank everyone for joining us. Uh, we've got, you know, some comments here. Great stories. Thanks for an interesting talk. Can't wait to read your book. And uh, I hope that everyone will join us for uh, future programs. You can see what our programs coming up are. We've got um, one next week. We have a Mighty Reels program and we have another book talk on March 8th. You can check these out at glbthistory.org slash events. And if you would like to let us know what your thoughts are on our programming, um, I'm going to be putting up a little slide here when we log off that is a little program survey. You can give us some feedback, what you enjoyed, what you would like to see in the future. And uh, I hope that everyone has a lovely evening. Have a good night.